Have you ever wanted to create a business that incorporates your passion? Today, we're going to join friend of the show, Matthew Newton, as he learns about a fellow CRNA's unique business that supports her passion for horses and family. Let's get to it. Welcome to the Plan B CRNA podcast. I'm your host, Bobby Jones, and I'm so excited that you're here. The Plan B CRNA podcast is the only show made specifically for nurse anesthetists who are exploring options outside of their traditional career paths. This is the place to expand your mind and your goals as we uncover new ways to produce side income together. Join me for some honest, unscripted discussions with other CRNAs who are transforming their financial lives. This episode is brought to you by On Call Capital. On Call Capital is dedicated to educating CRNAs and other healthcare providers about investing outside of the traditional stock market. On Call Capital also provides opportunities for you, yes, you, to create passive income and generational wealth while also lowering your taxable income through investments in the apartment and alternative investment spaces. If you haven't hit subscribe yet, make sure you do that right now so that you don't miss an episode. Thanks so much for joining me today. And now, on with the show. Welcome to a Provider Spotlight episode of the Plan B CRNA podcast. My guest today is a CRNA who hails all the way from High Point, North Carolina. She grew up in Winston-Salem, married the love of her life 10 years ago. She is the mother of two wonderful daughters, and she works at a hospital as a CRNA in Winston-Salem. I am happy to introduce you to Devin Washing. It's really great to have you on today. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me on today. It's an honor to be invited, for sure. Well, as we're very excited to have you. So you've done a lot with your career and a lot with your real estate endeavors. Can you go ahead and just start off by telling me a little bit about your career as a CRNA? What do you do? What kind of setting do you work in? And what made you want to be a CRNA? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I always wanted to be a CRNA since actually I was in high school because I have an aunt who's a CRNA and she would always talk to me about what she did at work. And then as a senior in high school, we had an opportunity to shadow careers of our choosing and I shadowed a CRNA and I knew from that point forward, that's what I wanted to do. So I went to UNC for nursing school and then I worked at Novant Health as a nurse for four years. Then went to Wake Forest for anesthesia school and then graduated in 2019 and then been working at Novant since as a CRNA, mostly at Forsyth Medical Center, which is the big hospital in Winston-Salem. And then I also flipped to some of the smaller Novant facilities. Yeah, I think I actually met you originally as a student at Wake Forest back in the day. Yes. Yeah. So my, it's one of the most important questions I always like to start off by asking everybody is that Curly from City Slickers question, what is the... What's your one driving force? What's the one thing that's most important in your life? So why do you, why do you choose to do, I guess, what you do? It's hard to put it down to one thing, but the first thing that pops into mind for me is just a lifestyle. I mean, of course, for me as well, but mostly for my family. You know, my husband and I are high school sweethearts. We got married at 22, and then I had my first daughter at 25. And so we have just grown up together in our marriage with children in our lives. And so we've always built our life around our children. We never really bought into the the idea that you had to have your careers and your whole life figured out before you bring children into the mix. So that being said, that means our choices along the way have always been, how can we be home with our children and have flexibility to be home when they're young, when they're not in school yet, be able to be home when they're sick, all those sort of things. And I think that's like, for most of the people I talk with, that's one of the most important things is how can I have the flexibility to actually spend time with my children when they're young? There's, a, there's an interesting statistic I read, which is kind of sad, that says by the time your children are 18, you've spent 90% of the time you ever will with them, which is kind of touching to think about. Like, you're like, wow, it's a crazy thing. So like, you know, why do we do what we do? It's so we can find more flexibility with them and help them grow up. So you have a, a rental property. Tell me, tell me here, what, what started you off on your real estate journey? Was there this aha moment that kind of led you to the realization that you needed another source of income or wanted a hobby or is this a retirement plan? What kind of got you on this path? Yeah, so it's kind of, this is kind of a roundabout answer, but basically we'll, we've always had this sort of idea that we would own our own business one day, which kind of sounds silly just to say, we don't know what it's going to be, but we just... I don't know. My husband has a background in finance and business. 
he was working as a civil engineer though. So he, he kind of has a lot of different skills that way. And, and I always like, I don't know, being creative and we just like, you know, being able to have flexibility that having your own business can afford. So it all kind of started because I have a great love and passion for horses. And so I finally bought my first horse about a year after graduating in a siege of school when I could actually afford one. And that was just a driving force too, for me to go to a school in a siege of school and be able to afford a horse. And so I had this horse that I'm boarding and we know that the long-term plan is to buy a piece of property where we can have horses in the backyard, you know, for me, but also for my family. I also think it's important for the kids to grow up in nature, outside, taking care of horses, you know, participating in family responsibilities. And also our business kind of arose of that, out of that idea that the children can actually help be a part of supporting our family. So we're having more time together and they also have that sort of sense of significance. So anyway, we're looking for properties for some time because there's not a ton of options that are close in. And uh, so my mom actually sent us the listing for the place we're now living about, you know, about two years ago. And I laughed when she first sent it to me because it was, it was a lot more than we were planning on spending. And it would have been taking on a huge undertaking just to care for the property and all those sort of things. But something about it, we couldn't get it out of our mind. And we happened to go look at it. We fell in love and we could see how much potential the property had to create our own business. And so we kind of just said, you know, if it's meant to be, it'll work out. And we just took one step at a time. And yeah, so now here we are. That's awesome. That sounds like a lot of fun. So tell me, what exactly is your property? You have a handful of acres, I'm assuming, your personal resident, yeah. a farm. Yeah, I'll kind of describe it. So yeah, we've got a, about 16 acres. We have our main residence, which the cool thing about that is the home is actually a replica of Gunston Hall. So if you're a history buff, that was George Mason's home, one of the authors of the Bill of Rights. And so that home can still be seen in Virginia. And so anyway, this our house is a replica of the um, So it's got a very colonial historic feel to it because Gunston Hall was built in 1755. So it's got that sort of historic look to it. And then behind our house, we have a horse barn. And one end of the horse barn is a guest house. And so we renovated that and created our short-term rental, which we call the stable house. And then the barn, we keep my horse, and then we bought a small pony, and then we board one other horse. And then behind the barn, we have pastures. So those staying in the stable house actually only have windows facing um, towards the horse pastures. So there's a private feeling there. And beyond the pastures is a creek and a pond and woods with a trail. Very nice. Very nice. So shameless plug time. What's the name of your property and where is it located? <laughs> it's called Willowview Farm. It was named that before we came here. There's a sign and everything and we loved it. So we went went with that. Yeah, we have a website. It's www.willowviewfarmnc.com. There's also a Facebook page. We have one for the horse farm and we have one for kind of weddings and events. Did I answer all your questions? <laughs> Get for your yeah, so I'm a guest and I have booked a night at your Airbnb. What can I expect? Is there is there events or things to do while I'm there? Is it just an overnight stay? Tell me about some of the, the many different, I guess, diversifications of business that you have going on. Yeah. So we do have different things going mm -hmm. on with our business. The Airbnb is kind of separate from the other things that we're doing. But it, when people come to book a stay, some people decide they just kind of want the very private feeling, which we respect. So you can self-check in. We can give you all the information over Airbnb. And, you, you know, you may see us out and about in the front yard. But for the most part, it's a very private feeling. Or we always offer to guests, especially if they have children, that we're happy to give tours of the property or introduce them to the horses. If there's kids, you know, our whole family go, will go out there. Our girls love meeting guests. It's like so exciting to them. And so we'll, you know, pull out the pony and let the kids brush the pony and that sort of thing. And we just love that. We've always loved hosting. We're kind of always the ones that try to host things for friends and family. And we really like giving people this sort of experience. So we, we never get tired of introducing people to the horses. It's, it's interesting because, you know, you, you, we talk about like it's a barn and a stable house. 
I looked at your pictures on your listing and it's fantastic looking. It looks, you know, like it has, it has a, it has a, a barn kind of woodsy feel to it, but I, it's luxury, which is really nice. I, I love, I love the way all the, how decorated it was and it looked. Nice. Uh, so you just started, opened it up for, as a wedding venue. And I saw the other day, I saw you have unicorn parties on there. Many of those. So that is brand new. The only ones we posted has been for my own children. <laughs> so we kind of joke that, you know, the pony's got to earn his keep because he's pretty much just a pasture pup. So, and I, this has been quite in the works in my brain for quite some time. Um, and we kind of did a run through with my daughter's third birthday party. But yeah, so basically we know unicorns are very popular these days. So we've got the unicorn horn for the pony. And we've got a real nice garden pergola area. So the idea is to have kind of a smaller scale party, but just kind of a boutique kind of feel, like just make it really nice. So we're advertising, we have six children and parents and they come over and it's all inclusive too. So parents don't have to worry about anything but showing up. So we have decor and the pergola area really doesn't need much decor. And we provide lunch and a cake and a craft and I love to paint. So that's, that's also something I do on the side if I get any free time ever. So I do face painting um, and then let them decorate the pony and then, or unicorn, I should say, and then go for pony rides. And then we've also just through other parts of the business have met a lot of great photographers, which I just think is so fun. And people just love capturing all those sorts of moments. So we added on a, an optional photo package if people want to do it's kind of like adding a mini session for each of the kids at your party onto the party. So that's the latest offering. <laughs> I love that. Even like, you know, like the pony parties and all that kind of stuff. That's so neat because it's, it's a time like that that you can spend with your kids that it's just invaluable. You know, at the, at the end of your life, you never look back and said, I wish I would have made more money. It's always, I wish I would have spent more time with family. Yeah, um, exactly. I'm going to steal that term pasture puff from you though. Next time I, I lay out my... <laughs> And I drink a margarita, and my wife says, "What do you do today?" I'm going to be like, "I was, <laughs> I was a pet, but I didn't accomplish it." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know the horses are just pretty much allowed to be out there and look pretty. So, <laughs> so as far as your Airbnb goes, do you have a specific way you price your nights? Do you use a system? Is there like a, a group you use, like AirDNA or anything like that? How did you come up with the number for how much you charge nightly? Honestly, that was a lot of trial and error. Of course, when you put in your very basic information, Airbnb recommends something, which for ours was super low because all it sees is, okay, this was the zip code you're in and you've got a one bedroom. But what it doesn't show is that we've got that it's a 1600 square foot space and it's on a farm and, you know, all those sorts of things, full on kitchen and all that all that. So you really can't go based off of just that. It gives you an idea where to start. And then, well, this will get into like mistakes. The mistakes we made was trying to be too low initially, you know, to get some people in the door and get reviews. But I can tell you it's, it's much better to have fewer stays at a, you know, decent price where you're getting quality clients. Cause otherwise if it's too low, then you're going to maybe get guests that you don't prefer to stay at your place trust me i as a new airbnb host i understand that i i had the thing yeah. about super host status which i should be at coming up here in about a month but you know when you get super host status you get 20 plus percent more bookings so it's worth it so i ended up discounting one or two nights a week here and there until i could get all the enough reviews to hit super host status which i'm, I'm finally should be at soon so mm -hmm. I, I definitely understand that i would rather have fewer bookings and better guests than yeah for sure. <laughs> so do you run this personally as a hobby or are you looking at like strict ROI numbers to where I'm, I'm trying to generate X amount per month? Do you have, do you have goals as far as like yearly revenue with this or is this just fun? So our whole business is, we don't really have specific numbers. We know what we were doing about on average per month last year. Honestly, what it comes down for us is you know, when we moved here, we took on a bigger mortgage and a lot more expenses. Just the cost of maintaining this place has been a learning curve for sure. And also we've had to buy tools that we've never had to, you know, commercial lawnmower, you know, I mean, I can't even believe my husband's probably taken 20 trips to the, you know, the land dump because of how much trimming we've done and trees that we've taken down. 
So just all the tools and expenses of living here, honestly, we're just trying to like come out even <laughs> with our, we want our revenue to cover the expenses. If there's a little leftover, that would be great. But a lot of these expenses would be personal expenses if we didn't have a business. Yeah, business to me, it sounds very similar. I don't know if you listen to like Bigger Pockets or any of these other guys. It's called house hacking where you'll buy a new duplex, you live in one half, and then you use the other half as a, like a rental. This is similar, but different. So, I mean, and realistically, anything you make is a win. So I, I commend you for just trying, you know, I don't this was a, you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. This is great. So we're coming into a recession this year. Have you mm -hmm. noticed a difference in bookings from last year to this year? Yeah, it, things have slowed down a little bit and we've played with price. We're going to get on more, you know, we're only on Airbnb right now. So we're going to make a listing on VRBO as well. But I mentioned earlier, we're kind of diversifying our offering. So photography is something that is always popular, I feel, and it's just so fun. So just kind of organically, I've met a lot of amazing photographers along the way, and it really motivated me to get more into that aspect of things. So we're working together with photographers on a bunch of mini sessions coming up. So for example, we have some Easter mini sessions coming up. I'm going to do a derby day because my horse is actually an extra race horse. So that's going to be really fun. We're doing mother and me mini sessions. We've been doing a lot of, a lot more bridal portraits. And then also the, the event planning, we're kind of also in the beginning stages of wedding and event planning, just intimate ceremonies, that sort of thing. Yeah. People always be getting married and so... <laughs> for the for the wedding and event planning, if you need any connections, I actually know some people in your area that do that. that oh, that'd be awesome. I could probably hook you up with if you'd like. It's all about networking. It it really is. And I would say that more than anything is what we found. And we've kind of we've grown things at the rate that we're comfortable doing. So we be we've kind of opened up a lot of different avenues, but we have decided to not really take on any weddings until this year. So we that has given us time to edit and re-edit and re-edit what we want to offer based on talk. Like, for example, a couple months ago, we went to a wedding expo. We just talked to a lot of different vendors there and, and people in the industry, you know, you'd think there'd be a lot of competition and stuff, but everybody just kind of, you know, they're an open book and it's, it's been really nice to meet some people and who have helped us along the way. So since you're sharing your property, do you typically interact with a lot of your guests or is it just completely automated or do you just kind of take it as it goes? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like I mentioned, if people want to just do their own thing, that's cool. If they want to, I mean, we have had guests that now come to visit their family here like every other month and they have an eight-year-old who plays with our seven-year-old. So we're like good friends now and the girls play together all weekend when they stay. So We've made friends along the way. We, you know, sometimes we just see people to give them a quick tour and intro to the horses, or sometimes we don't see them at all. So it's kind of just up to the guest. I like much about horses. I didn't realize that horses were so labor intensive. You know, I thought, of, you yeah. know, it's like in, my, in, in a non horse person's brain, a dog plus. So I've been having, you know, realized how <laughs> they took to, you know, eat upkeep, you know, shots, keep feeding. How much, like, how much would you say on a yearly basis just for one horse's upkeep costs, like talking boarding to the whole shebang? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's hard. That's hard to put a number on. I probably don't want to know the number. <laughs> so for example, like I'll tell you, so I was paying before we moved here, I was paying 650 or the barn I was at is now the board is 650 a month. Um, which seems high, but when you see all the expenses, I mean, that's easy to get to the horses eat. So right now we've have all the grass closed off until it's grown high enough for the horses to eat. And so they're eating hay 24 seven right now. And my horse, for example, eats at least 30 pounds of hay a day. So, you know, my husband's putting out hay, you know, two bales, at least two bales, at least every day. And they're getting fed twice a day to get all their nutrients and supplements and that sort of thing. Um, and hay's not cheap, <laughs> especially with everything going up these days. And then my horse, he's barefoot, which is cheaper than horseshoes. But to get him trimmed, he gets trimmed every four weeks. And so that's 70 bucks. So yeah, it adds up. But And 
We actually just spent a thousand dollars at Southern States today buying lime and fertilizer. So even the grass isn't free. <laughs> but it's funny you talk about horse horse hoof trimming. Some mm-hmm. reason, like three or four months ago, my Facebook randomly decided that I was interested in horse hoof trimming, and it <laughs> sent me videos every day. I would find videos of people like shearing horse hooves and cleaning horse hooves. So yeah. that I watched a couple of them and I'm like, it is actually kind of interesting <laughs> watching. I'm addicted to them actually. They're like oddly satisfying to watch. <laughs> it is. It's, it's kind of like one of those, it's kind of like one of those videos where somebody's like, oh, like Dr. Pimple Popper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like I, you know, to the point where I was like, oh, I guess I am kind of interested in it now. Maybe Facebook just predicted what I would like, which is weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's so funny. Yeah, yeah, I would say like with the horse too, I, I feel like us starting this business has been the same as getting my first horse because, you know, this horse that I bought now two and a half years ago was my first horse ever. And I would say I went from knowing very little about horse ownership to, you know, every other month I was going down a rabbit hole and now I've, you know, learned about nutrition and hoof trimming and hoof care and land management for horses and And I think, you know, if there's one message to people who want to go for something, it's you don't have to be an expert. You just tackle it one thing at a time. And there's so many races out there. I I can't imagine that there's any reason that you couldn't learn about anything you wanted to learn about. That's great. I love I always tell people like my the overall plan to take one goal at a time. So if I'm running a mile, it's, you know, how far is that next signpost? It's just so it makes life so much more manageable if you just break one big task down into many small, little, very achievable goals. So it sounds like you've had a handful of guests that come back. Do you price any differently for family and friends or for repeat guests? Yeah. So, you know, you kind of get a vibe from people and if it's people that they've stayed and, you know, we've seen that they've taken care of the place and we've met them and there's a level of trust there. And, you know, maybe that's after the first stay or maybe that's after the second stay or whatever. We'll reach out to them outside of Airbnb, of course, because you can't even do it through Airbnb. But we'll offer to do something outside of Airbnb. So we have like a standard short term rental contract and we'll price it in between, you know, where, you know, there's so many Airbnb fees that both parties win, you know, by kind of meeting in the middle of where those fees would add on. Family stays for free, of course. If friends are visiting us, we love that they can stay over there and have their own space. And actually, we have somebody checking in tomorrow who is one of our neighbor's relatives. So we gave them, you know, we give them a better price and that sort of thing. Very nice, very nice. So you talk about, you know, feeling out the people that are there. Have you had any interesting guests or horror stories or any weird requests or comments made by guests? Yeah. So I have one horror story and then I have one funny one. Yeah. is I'm like still sick to my stomach when I think about it, but I'll mention it because it's a good learning lesson. But we had some pretty rough people show up and, you know, our place, it says a limit of four people. Well, okay. You know, it's, it's getting dark and all these cars are showing up and everything looks rough. The music's bumping. I'm just going to kind of, it's a very long story, but the bottom line is Getting them kicked out through Airbnb was a nightmare. Using Airbnb's customer service was a nightmare. And in one night, our place was, there was holes in the wall. The whole place reeked of cigarette smoke. There were cigarette butts left on our headboard and scraped against the walls into the smushed into the carpet. I mean, $2,000 worth of damage in one night. But the reason it's worth bringing up is it changed how we do things. And, you know, Airbnb, when you set up a listing, they strongly, strongly encourage you to do the instant booking, which we do not do at all anymore because our only bad experiences have been instant books. Because the only thing they look at is that you've verified your identity, which only means that you've provided your driver's license or something. So now all of our guests have to make a reservation request. So we can decide only to accept people that have five-star reviews, only people that we get good vibes from. We can ask them why they're coming. And, you know, we used to be kind of like, oh, it's not really our business why they're coming or blah, 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 or give them the benefit of the doubt. But after that, we kind of learned that being nice doesn't mean not having boundaries and protecting yourself. 
And then I also say, like, I expected more support from Airbnb, but I would want people setting up an Airbnb now to know that I don't view them as anything more than a glorified booking system with a little insurance that may, that, you know, has helped us some, but an insurance policy, but protect yourself, pretend that they're not going to help you at all because it's, I was really disappointed with the customer service, but of course you, you can't beat the people that you reach by using their website. So I've heard very similar things from a lot of people that have had problems with Airbnb. I knock on wood, luckily haven't had to file any complaints yet, but I've heard Airbnb and VRBO are very much client first, host last, which is for a lot of people, this is a way of life. You know, I mean, like my cabin that I rent is if I get zero bookings, that, that's tough because that comes out of my pocket in the end, you know, when they protect only one party and not their hosts, which is their core business, it gets really challenging. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I'd also want people to know that it's almost impossible to get a review removed, even if said person violated the rules by hosting a party in your place, which is against Airbnb policy. So if you have any doubt of somebody, just don't accept it. And we have a new policy too. So when you accept, when somebody books a place at your stay, they are saying, yes, we yeah. agree to the rules, but how do you know that they've read the rules? So what we started doing was in our messages and we have it automated. So two days before we send them a message that has all of our rules laid out and we say, please, state that you have read and accept these rules only then will you receive your check-in code and that just it's not really and it, technically it's not anything different than they've already agreed to so if they have any trouble if they you know complain they've already agreed to that technically but that is forcing them to say yes i have read to agree the rules so if there's any doubt then that protects us to you know whatever call the local authorities and have them removed if they're violating that that's actually good. There's actually a podcast that's called uh, Vacation Rental Insiders. And that's one of the things that they recommend is, you know, make sure that your people state, I have read the rules and yet we're even set on the code. That's one of the things that they recommended on there. No, that's interesting. Yeah. I wish I had known that before. <laughs> yeah. I do. I do like crazy amount of research before I jump into anything. So I think I probably listened to, I don't know, 50 plus hours of podcasts called to deal with all the things. I'm like, tell me all of that. I get in there. I don't want to be surprised. Yeah. Yeah. That's why we've kind of entered into this wedding thing very, very slowly and almost hesitantly, but you know, we're keeping it to what we're comfortable with. So you said you had another story about an interesting guest that you had check in and check out. Yeah, you definitely meet some interesting people. So we had a guest request a reservation and we accepted they had good reviews and all that. And so we they looked through our rules, which we, of course, appreciated, but we should have known probably they were pretty paranoid at this point because they're like, one of our rules is do not enter pond, which is pretty self-explanatory, right? Like we just don't want people going in the pond and drowning and then suing us. So they're like, what do you mean by do not enter pond? And we're like, I don't know, like don't walk in it or wade in it or swim it. Don't bring a boat and get in it. <laughs> like just don't go in the pond. And uh, so then anyway, they came. And they were there for a night and then they were supposed to be there for several nights. And then they just packed up and left and sent us a message and said, we've checked out. We want all of our money back. You have a camera inside that you didn't disclose and sent us all these screenshots of the Airbnb's policy, which, you know, we're quite familiar with, of course. And so we're like, there's definitely not a camera inside. What can you describe where you, the said camera was and. So anyway, it turns out they thought, so there used to be a security system, you know, just like a home security system, not with cameras or anything in the stable house. So it wasn't even active, which even if it was, it wasn't a camera, it was just a motion detector in the corner. It's just one of those ones that there's no screen or anything. It just blinks red if it detects motion, you know, it's just infrared. And they're like, that's a camera. And I'm like, okay, no, it's just a motion detector, but they still didn't like realize that that didn't mean it. Well, if it can detect motion, it's a camera. So I'm having this whole long conversation with, no, it uses infrared technology. And then I like, but it's so dumb that we had to go through all this, but you know that somebody can leave a review and really screw you over. So anyway, we take the thing down. So there's like some of the things you just don't think of. Like if I thought somebody was going to mistake it for a camera, I would have taken it down. We took it down. We took a picture of the serial number, Googled it and 
prove to them that it was not, did not have any, any monitoring capabilities. And you know what? Some things are just not worth arguing about. So we just gave her a refund and said, bye. <laughs> so that was just kind of an interesting experience. That's so funny. Some of the things that guests come up with, it's all, it never fails. I had a, I had a guest with that their entire stay hinged on whether my refrigerator had a certain kind of crushed ice that came out of it. And they're asking, <laughs> like, I, I know a lot about my property. I don't know what kind of crushed ice. Yeah. I know it crushes ice, but I don't know what cube format of like right. crushing this. The, the, you know, the, some, some of the stuff they come up with is just, is beyond me. <laughs> yeah. There's definitely a couple of people out there who are looking for something to be wrong so they can get some money back, unfortunately, but we've only probably had that happen in two instances. But Yeah. And it's hard too, when you're a new host and every review counts so much. I mean, one, yeah. you know, like one of the new hosts actually told me, they said that if, you know, any of your first 10 reviews are less than five star, they're like, just start your account over because it'll, it'll torpedo you. Yeah. It's crazy. And also I would tell anybody doing this for sure have cameras outside. You know, we don't have any indoor cameras, but you know, of course this is also in our backyard so we can keep an eye on things. But my mom just bought a rental property and starting an Airbnb. And I said, you have to have cameras. How do you know if, you know, 10 cars show up? You don't know unless you get a camera. So you can constantly, you know, even you have it. So it notifies you on your phone. Anytime that there's motion, you can make sure, you know. I have two cameras on my cabin. One is on the parking lot and one is on the front door, just pretty much to make sure no one's sneaking in and out and wanting to see how many cars are there. And I literally have mine set up 15 second clips <laughs> for 15 seconds. I, it just gives me a snapshot of, is there a, a bus full of partiers showing yeah. up? And that's that, I, you know, I don't, I don't monitor them. I just, you know, whenever I arrive and when they, you know, like once during the stay, I'll usually just, you know, just check in just to make sure there's not 17 cars in the driveway, which does happen. That kind of wears yeah. Really destroy a place, as, as you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely important. And also, you know, if you see anything that you know goes against your rules, go ahead and save that video because Airbnb will require proof for you to get your money back, or you know, to if you have to file an air cover report. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So, as a professional uh, super host that you are. <laughs> tips for any new investors looking to start an Airbnb or anything along the lines? Yeah. So ours is a little bit unique, but you mentioned the decor earlier and I had, you know, researched some Airbnb stuff too. And people say, you know, having a theme is fun. I think you can have a theme without being like corny. So we definitely, everything in there is horse, but I would say like tastefully horse. My husband was glad though, because all the horse decor went to the stable house because <laughs> I had a lot of that. But it just goes along with providing experience. You don't have to be a horse lover to come there and just appreciate what it is. And then we also just do, it's the little things that count. So we have a local market that makes these amazing chocolate chip cookies. So we leave cookies there. Sometimes we do the Moravian cookies. And then there's just little things too. It's like, what are little things that are not going to cost me that much? That's just going to be like the cherry on top for somebody. Somebody comes there with kids. Like if somebody says, oh, I'm coming with my two-year-old, we just go ahead and, you know, we have kids, we have plenty of toys. We put together a box of age-appropriate toys and books. If they need to pack and play in a high chair, we'll set that up. We have like a futon. If somebody's getting in late and we know they're going to need the futon, we'll go ahead and make the bed. And just those little things that we have, like, you know, we keep drinks in the fridge and we keep some spare snacks. And for somebody, that's just going to be like, you know, so awesome and to have some coffee there, that sort of thing. It's those little personal touches that go away. I give out a, a Christmas ornament for all my guests. And I also, have, well, like, so interestingly enough, I'm a family man. So my wife and I, one of our traditions, our whole relationship is any place we go on vacation or any significant event, we always buy a Christmas ornament from wherever we're at. And then we have a, we have a, a relationship family travel tree at home. And we get from pretty much just things from our life. Uh, mm -hmm. So. You know, I made a special cozy bear lodge ornament, had them printed off. And then so I give out one to every guest. And then we have like log cabin wooden coasters that I allow people to purchase if they want. And it was funny. My last guest actually was like, Hey Matt, I took a bunch of your coasters. I don't have Venmo. Though. How can I? And I was like, you know what? Like, just leave me a good review and don't, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, Oh, thank you so much. And I'm like, yeah, it's okay. You know, like, yeah. The whole expense to get all like all this, all the swag made was like maybe five. Right. So I was like, you know what? 
as long as you and your family had a good time, you just enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like you said, just being flexible like that. Like if, you know, if it's a good guest, we're happy to, we allow early check-ins without extra charge. If it's, if we don't have somebody there earlier, so we allowed late checkouts. We just start flexible. Yeah, that's good. And I also like that you talk about creating kind of like a niche space. Like yours is like horse themed. I've always, yeah. I'm a giant nerd. So none of my themed ideas would be fun. Like, cause nobody, <laughs> nobody would want to go stay in like a Harry Potter or, you know, Harry <laughs> oh, I would. There are some of those. <laughs> all, the, all the retro video games or something like that. I, I, yeah. I think it would be awesome, but I have a feeling not everybody else is 90s children like me. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. So, you uh, get the right version. <laughs> put yourself out there. You have an Airbnb. You have a farm, a wedding venue, specialized parties for kids. It's a lot, you know, but for every success, it takes a lot to get there. My favorite question I always ask people is, Tell me about your biggest failure in your life, your career, your investment, and what did it bring you? Yeah, that's always a hard one too. Not that there hasn't been like a ton of failures. I guess we've been lucky that there hasn't been like one giant one. I mean, to me, the biggest thing that comes to mind was that party that I told you about. That was real. That was real gut wrenching for us because, you know, this is our home. We opened it up to people. We made ourselves vulnerable. And we felt really taken advantage of, and, you know, we're in the beginning stages of all this. And we almost gave up, to be honest, because we're like, if this is how it's going to be, this is, we don't want any part of this, but you know what? We figured out what do we need to change? But you know what? We just, I'm very like sensitive person. So yeah, that bothered me for a really long time. I would say I can get over a lot of things, but somehow that was, that was real, really felt like a violation. So we learned from it. We learned how to protect ourselves. We went back and looked at our insurance. We looked at how we did all those things. And it was not fun to do. It was like the not, you know, it's the not fun part, but it has to be done. And so, you know, we bring out those things, but since then, knock on wood, we've not had any, you know, major issues and it's been so rewarding and go with your gut. You know, there's been a couple of times that I'm like, I don't really have an answer to not let them, you know, very specific to not let these people, but you know what? Just go with your gut, you know. You got to look out for your family. It's good that you didn't let it kind of get you down, you know. The was success is the ability to go from one failure to another without any loss of enthusiasm. Be a little Churchill for today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love that. It's very true. It's, you know, fall off the horse, you get back on quite, quite literally. Yeah, yeah I know. Like I told you earlier, I can relate everything to horse training, but my horse, just as a quick excerpt is so I mentioned he's an ex race horse. So I got him as a six year old off the track thoroughbred. And when I first bought him, I thought, what the heck am I doing? I'm a first time horse owner. I'm an amateur. I don't know how to train a horse. And I've just bought this horse that won't tie that I can't catch out of the field. Won't get on a trailer. He's got parasites. He's underweight. His hooves are a mess and he wants nothing to do with people. The first time we tried to shoe him, he reared up and ran the whole length of the barn backwards. And just before this podcast, I was out there working with him at Liberty, meaning without any ropes and having him run around with me and jump over jumps. And he just, he does it for like the fun of it. And he, and I'm no expert trainer, but I, that's literally been two and a half years of building trust and figuring out one problem at a time and constantly going back to the basics. So everything in life, I think is like that. If there's a problem, go back to the basics, you know, and then dig a little deeper, you know, figure out whatever it is. So. I have great advice. Do you have any, uh, do you have any charities or anything you give back to your community? So I'll tell you my retirement plan. That is my goal. So growing up, I volunteered at a therapeutic horse riding barn. So where they took in horses. <laughs> rescue horses, rehabilitated them and used them for therapy for kids with cerebral palsy, autism, you know, whatever. So I would absolutely love to do that. Definitely. We have to get a little bit more established and to be able to, you know, that's going to take some investment to you to be able to take on more horses and that sort of thing. And, but that was, that would be my goal for when I'm more of like an empty nester and stuff. And I'd love to rescue horses. Um, and then currently just a small thing we do now is we invite girls in the local community to come over and get to be around the horses and learn about them. And it's just kind of my way of sharing my passion with others and providing something that I would have loved to have growing up. Excellent. And then I guess for, for our last question, 
what actions do you currently take to better your mind and body? Do you spend time with your horses? Do you read? What do you what do you do to have some tapping time? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Of course, you know, like you and I talked yeah. about, we make family time a priority. When I need just me time, it's going out there with the horses. I may not even be riding or training or whatever, but it might just be sitting out there with a book next to my horse or even just scooping manure. Like it's just therapy to be out there with them, watching them. So that's kind of my me time. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be on the podcast today. This has actually been really great. One last time before we go, can you tell our viewers where to find you, how to go about getting to your business if they wanted to book? Sure, yeah. If you look on Airbnb, we're called Willow View Farm Stable House. The link would be airbnb.com slash H slash Willow View Farm. And you can also get to that link from our website, which is willowviewfarmnc.com. On Facebook, we're Willow View Farm Weddings and Events. Ian on Instagram, we're Willow View Farm Weddings, all one word. So if you search Willow View Farm, you should be able to find us. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, and we will catch up down the line. All right. Thanks so much. Devin has such a cool story. She and her husband are true entrepreneurs, taking the initial leap to purchase their farm and then learning as they went along. The journey for them was just beginning, and they've learned some hard lessons along the way, but that's the nature of business, isn't it? I mean, learning those lessons helped Devin to learn different ways to protect their business, to protect their property, and to run their Airbnb more effectively. But what I admire is how they've turned this farm into multifaceted revenue streams. I mean, you've got the Stable House Airbnb, they host weddings, photography, the derby, and even the unicorn parties. These are fun lifestyle choices for her family, but they're also creative ways to make multiple streams of income from a single piece of property. And I just love these kinds of stories, and I hope you did too. That's going to do it for today's show. Make sure you check out Devin's website at www.willowviewfarmnc.com, and you can also check out the show notes for other links. This is Bobby Jones signing off. Until next time. Stay safe and take care of each other out there. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of the Plan B CRNA podcast. If you haven't already subscribed and reviewed the show, I'd be honored if you took the extra time. It really helps to expand our reach and get the word out about the show. If you're a CRNA who is interested in sharing your story on our podcast, I'd love to have you. Please email me at bobby at oncallinvestments.com for more information. This episode was brought to you by On Call Capital. They are dedicated to helping providers like you develop passive income and generational wealth through investments in the apartment and alternative investment spaces. Feel free to check out their website at www.oncallinvestments.com and subscribe to their free educational email series. You can find On Call Capital on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also check out our YouTube page where you'll find all of the show episodes along with other educational videos. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode.